Dear colleagues, also from my side, uh, a warm welcome to this webinar from Hamburg. Clemens and I are based in Hamburg. As Niels has already um, given an overview, the first part is on background and fund allocation models, and the second part is on how to involve the business sector in TVET financing. And the first slide is to explain why vocational training is more expensive than other other forms of education. So if we look at the VET provider level where training actually takes place, we have normally high investment cost for buildings and equipment. We need to consider savings for reinvestment into such equipment. We have high running cost, uh, mainly for training material, for con consumables, for maintenance of equipment. And we have a higher uh, cost component in terms of the personnel as we face a higher uh, teacher-learner ratio compared to secondary or higher education. On top of uh, that, uh, on top of the cost of the TVET providers, we also have to maintain the TVET system as a whole on, on national or regional level. Um, so this involves standard and curriculum development, further training of mainly initial education and further training of teachers, assessment and certification and regulation bodies, authorities need to be staffed and, and maintained. So VET in general is a high costly exercise for all countries. So one has to discuss some cost sharing models. The challenges of VET financing can be described as follows. So in most countries we face a chronic under financing of the system. Um, we all know what this means. Um, we, have, we, we see often uh, poorly equipped training providers. We see a lack, a lack of availability of training material. Uh, teachers are often badly uh, or poorly paid. And so this all um, uh, leads into a bad quality or insufficient quality. So one can state that state budgets are normally not sufficient to ensure high quality of training at a national scope. And uh, revenues from participants must remain at a low level for social reasons. And um, income generation activities from uh, training providers can be mostly ne neglected as training for production, etc., is not generating really a high share uh, of income uh, according to what is required. On the other hand, uh, we also see that budget allocation mechanisms are often inefficient and intransparent. So um, cost structures are often unknown. There's a weak um, basis for uh, economic and financial planning and fund allocation to TVET providers is often not really um, driven by demand and performance, but uh, it is uh, linked to other categories, which we would like to discuss with you further. So if we talk about uh, sustainable VET financing, we should look into two directions. First, this is uh, fund generation, and the other one is fund allocation. Um, if we talk about fund generation, we could discuss um, diversification of funding. So uh, both uh, or all the various participants uh, or members of the system, the state enterprises and individuals who participate in training could contribute to funding. Also donors could contribute, but this is of course not a sustainable solution. And on the other hand, um, we should not only look where the funds come from, but also we shall distribute the funds. So the criteria for fund allocation should be really uh, demand and quality. And mechanisms have to be designed in a way that we avoid misuse and we ensure transparency. In both areas, fund generation and fund allocation, the private sector, the business sector can play a role. And this will be discussed in the second part of this presentation. So we think that um, it should be a general understanding that uh, VET financing 
should mainly have two objectives. It should increase the effectiveness of the VAT system. This means that uh, we should design the financing mechanism in a way that it really is an incentive um, for quality TVET to have an employment impact for the, uh, for the target groups, which we address. And on the other hand, uh, the VET financing mechanism should also um, ensure that efficiency of the VET system is increased. So here we refer to the input-output ratio of the VET process. Um, before we come to specific examples of um, uh, VET financing mechanisms or models, we would like to familiarize you with uh, two general categories of funding. Um, we have to differentiate between supply side and demand side financing. Supply side means that funding goes to the training provider to, uh, to finance infrastructure, personnel and the running cost, while uh, demand side financing means that funds go to the target group, to the beneficiaries, and they decide on fund allocation. They actually make the decision where to be trained and where the funds go to through um, training fees. Um, while the first, um, the supply side financing is of course an important element to ensure the availability of bed capacities in general. So that is normally the task of the state to do transactions to TBED providers or to use other means to ensure that uh, sufficient supply is available for VET uh, services. Um, while on the other hand, um, the target group is often not able to finance uh, VET services on a cost covering levels and therefore one sh should or could consider stipends, scholarships, student loans or training vouchers to, um, to enable the target group also to, to finance um, the uh, service provision from the demand side, and this would actually be a full market-driven approach. So the second slide um, shows a differentiation between input-based and output-based financing. Also, these are important categories if we look at uh, allocation mechanisms. Um, the input-based financing is actually um, a financing uh, to training providers based on their size, based on their capacities or their investment needs. So while the output-based financing relates to training results, uh, this could be capacity utilization, uh, the number of successfully graduate learner, graduated learners or the employment rate, etc. So uh, one could say that uh, input-based financing um, is of course um, not so much an, uh, an incentive for quality improvement, while uh, output-based financing has this uh, effect that we can trigger quality through output-based financing, but uh, there is also the risk that um, training providers would only allow learners with a higher entrance qualification to enter the training so that they meet the funding requirements. We call this a creaming effect, which is actually a negative incentive, which should be avoided. So um, having said this, we can maybe already conclude the first part of um, the presentation um, by looking at this um, how do we call it, a system of coordinates uh, where we differentiate um, different funding models uh, between input, out, input orientation and output orientation on the other side and also a centralized approach vice versa to a more decentralized approach. While the centralized approaches are highly regulated by the state normally, uh, the decentralized approaches can be considered as market oriented. On the, on the bottom left part of the diagram, we have this what we call budget oriented funding. Um, state 
the state provides the budget for investment. This is uh, a common practice and it is actually the foundation for each uh, vocational education and training system in all countries. Um, this is um, a necessary financing or fund allocation model, but of course it only um, provides sufficient capacity. It has not really an impact on quality. The second model uh, we call program-oriented financing. In this case, the state provides certain budgets against, uh, against output criteria. So, um, as I said before, this uh, financing could be linked to um, successful graduates and so forth. Um, some countries like Vietnam, uh, for example, they already start to shift from budget uh, oriented to program oriented financing, but it is still a centralized state driven approach. When we go to the more decentralized models, um, we can differentiate between a contract based financing and learner centers financing. The contract-based financing is actually uh, a possibility to, um, to tender certain training programs by the state and to leave it to the market of training providers to respond to these tenders. So this is the case, for example, when a certain sector or skills for a certain sector uh, are needed and uh, the market is not sufficiently responsive like for digitization or for any particular new development in the labor market, such models are applied to trigger the training providers to provide certain uh, uh, training services in these areas. While um, we could also use uh, this, or we could apply this concept in challenge funds where um, the training providers could proactively uh, apply for funding, for grant funding, if they meet certain requirements. The last um, bullet uh, in the corner uh, top right is the learner-centered financing, which I already explained before. So here we have uh, the situation that the funds go to the learners directly and the learners make the decision where to buy um, their training services which they require. This is a pure market-driven approach uh, but it needs often support for the target group to balance uh, social needs. I would like to call back um, the main objective is of course to overcome the chronic underfinancing of that so uh, the business sector can reduce the cost burden of the state considerably if the business sector is on board um, and is contributing by either providing training by uh, its own uh, companies or by uh, contributing to a central budget uh, through training levies. These are mainly the two options uh, where we can consider the business sector as, uh, con uh, as being contributing to uh, that financing. Of course, it is not only uh, a matter of problem solving or solving the, un, uh, the underfinancing problem, but also to increase the uh, ownership of the business sector in the VET system. So uh, VET is always about relevance and quality, and often it has a bad reputation if it is only just state-driven or uh, performed by the state. So if we involve the business sector, we can uh, definitely improve uh, the labor market relevance, the workplace relevance of that provision and this should be achieved uh, as this would lead to employment. So if we look at these two options um, differently, uh, the first option as mentioned uh, is the direct participation in training delivery which we call the dual approach. This can, of course, only be achieved if the companies really recognize that they have a direct benefit. So if they are requested to invest their time and their funds or training materials, etc., and their labor into training, uh, there should be a benefit. 
Usually this benefit comes through involvement of the trainee in the production process or the service provision process. So um, um, this has a long tradition in many countries, including Germany, of course, but uh, it is often difficult to convince uh, companies where this system is not uh, already established. So th there, in these areas, in these countries where it is not existing, training concepts must uh, be made available. So um, uh, companies must be uh, made familiar with the concept, must be trained, in-company trainers must be trained so that companies will also be able to perform as training providers. So the second option is maybe even a bit more difficult. So uh, this looks at um, providing uh, real financial contributions of companies into a national or a sector-wide training fund. This uh, is called the Levy uh, financing system. Um, this can, can be an option, but is of course only possible if certain um, regulations are in place. So um, uh, that fund is usually uh, a good idea as, it, uh, as the funds who are, which are summarized there are really dedicated for the VET purpose. They cannot be used for other state um, expenses like road construction or whatever. So the earmarking of funds is secured, but uh, companies who uh, are willing to, to pay into such a fund uh, call for transparent management uh, systems, uh, and they usually want to have a stake in decision-making. So how are the funds be used? And they also claim to receive a compensation, a grant, payment back for their own training activities. So um, in the end, it is to be ensured that the business sector has an influence also on what is happening in the VET system. They have to have a stake in uh, standard development and curriculum development and so forth. And then they can be convinced to pay into such a fund. But it is, a, we know many countries where uh, uh, laws have already been established but the funds are not operational as the business sector cannot really be convinced in germany for example we have such a fund for the construction sector but there it is limited just for the companies in that sector this might be a way out to convince companies so the last slide of my input today is the next diagram this is may, may, maybe a more theoretical and a very comprehensive diagram where we see a national training fund in the middle uh, where donors can contribute, where the state can contribute, where enterprises pay levies into this fund and uh, out of the fund, various payments are possible either back to the enterprises for training services or to public or private providers or even um, uh, training vouchers or grants or credits can be paid off, out of such a fund. So maybe we can summarize that VET financing is an important issue. It has an influence on uh, the efficiency and the effectiveness of uh, VET provision. Um, if we come back to input and output based financing models, we could say that input based financing is important to secure at least the VET capacities to a certain level, but that output based financing allows a flexible adjustment of VET uh, approaches or VET offers towards demand and quality. So in my opinion, both models should be combined to um, achieve um, well, sufficient outreach and and um, and quality at the same time. Uh, with regard to the business sector involvement, uh, we could state that generally the direct participation through dual training would be the main objective, is favorable. Um, but uh, we face, and that was also part of the discussion in the breakout sessions, um, conceptual support might be required uh, to get the business sector on board. Um, 
maybe also financial incentives uh, to a decreasing uh, with a decreasing mechanism. I would like to mention that a challenge fund, donor funded challenge fund, uh, might support such approaches. There is a new project of KFW currently implemented in the Western Balkans, which you might have heard about, the Regional Challenge Fund and the Kosovo Challenge Fund, uh, which uh, Planco is involved in. But um, if we look at a more national approach, um, training funds with Levy grant systems could also help to generate sufficient funds on a sustainable basis, especially in areas where the business sector is really not interested, but should contribute uh, to ensure that um, funds are available. 